for us in our worship. We are continuing what I had planned to continue uh, last Lord's Day before I got sick from the second half or the second part of Paul's letter to Titus. And our study this evening will come from the third chapter. We need to remember that Titus was preaching on the island of Crete that had several congregations of the Lord's church. And one of the things that the Holy Spirit had Paul to write to him to do was to appoint elders in every city. And there was a problem with Paul's teaching on Crete. As there is a problem with that everywhere and will be until the Lord comes again. There are many, many things that Paul wrote to Titus about. But tonight we're looking at chapter 3. In sections 1 through verses 1 through 10, we could call that uh, godly living or a demonstration of good works. Have you ever heard of or read about people or even seen movies about people that want to be off the grid or they want to be have nothing to do with civil government? And maybe that was the better expression I should have used. There are a lot of anti-government people. Christians cannot be anti-government people. It doesn't mean that we go along with everything that the government says or does, but as far as their existence is concerned, Paul says to, re to Titus to remind the Christians to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed or every good work. You may recall in the 12th chapter of Matthew where the Herodians and some other Jewish people came to Jesus about paying, about paying taxes. Begin with verse 13 of Matthew chapter Matthew chapter 12 I think I must have that wrong. I know you never do that. But they came to Jesus about paying taxes, and the, they, they wanted to know, do we, get, do we pay taxes to Caesar or not? And Jesus asked them for, uh, asked them for a coin. He said, whose image is on the coin? They said, well, it's Caesar's image. They said, therefore, render to Caesar that which is Caesar and render to God that which is God's. Without looking at the details of this, Jesus is endorsing the existence of, of secular government and supporting paying taxes. The poll tax was what they had to pay. It was a human tax. It wasn't taxes on goods. It was just taxes for being, being a Roman citizen. And that being the case, they didn't feel like they needed to do that. So they were trying to entrap Jesus with it. In Romans chapter 13, the Apostle Paul also talked about civil law. And you have to think. You think our government today is difficult. You think it's riddled with corrupt people. Human governments have been that way for ages. They've always been that way. But, the, but what about, how does God look at civil government? Paul says in verse 1 of Romans 13, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and, whose, and those which exist are established by God. God allows civil government. I know that in some countries, it's awful. It is awful. I was talking to someone about the situation in the country of Haiti recently. And, and this man was from there. And he says, you would not believe how corrupt things are in that country. And I said, they have a long history of corruption. He said, yes, they do. Unless someone comes in there and able, is able to change it, it will continue to be corrupt. 
Just because people, however, even in our country, corrupt things does not mean that civil government is not needed. Some civil government is better than none because then you have total anarchy. It's just, and so God is not sanctioning the behavior of ungodly government officials, but he does sanction the existence of civil government, and Paul talk, Jesus talked about it, Paul talked about it. In 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 13, the apostle Peter talks about the endorsement of civil government. The apostle would write in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 13, Who is there that will harm you if you're doing good? Be zealous. I don't know how I got these scriptures mixed up. It's, it's been one of these things. At, at any rate, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 13, I was reading the wrong chapter. I didn't mix them up. I took a nap this afternoon, and maybe I nipped took too long for it. In 1 Peter 2, 13, submit yourselves to the, for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king, as to the one in authority, or to governors, as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. And that's kind of a summation of what Paul would write in Romans 13 with regard to. We need for the government to punish certain people for certain crimes. There are certain people that need to be in jail. There are certain people who need to be in jail for a long time. There are certain people that need eventually to be put to death because they committed a capital offense. And God would sanction that. In Romans 13, Paul talks about the government. He says, he does not bear the sword in vain. What's a sword for used by the government? It's an executioner's sword. There was a time when people, when they violated the law of Rome, they would be killed by a sword, beheaded. It's, but God sanctioned that for people who actually had broken certain laws. If you do some study on human law, you will find many times, if you go back far enough, that they're based on the Old Testament. The, the rules and regulations that God gave for for punishments for certain infractions of his will. This would, this would be for that, this would be for that, and the, and the more horrible the act, then the higher the penalty to be paid. And a lot of governments have based their, their, their laws on the Bible, whether they realize they've done that or not. The second thing that we read in, in Titus chapter 3 has to do, beginning with verse beginning with verse 2, to have that with our relationship to government in verse 1, relationship to people in verse 2. To malign no one. That is, to slander no one. Sometimes I wish the New American Standard would use some different words. It's the one I study from, but to slander. To slander is to, to say things about other people so as to make them really look bad to give them a bad name. Now, when you know of certain people, say, you know, he murdered 13 people and they finally caught up with him. That's not slander. That's presenting facts. He has done that to himself, but go around just talking about people and running people down and trying to make them look bad, that's slander. If, and, how, and, and I'm convinced that most of what Paul is talking about here, it has to do with members of the church. We ought to treat each other with respect. And if I have a problem with you, I don't need to be telling everybody else about it. If I think there's something wrong, then I should, in love and concern, come and talk to you. Say, you know, somebody said this, and I was just wondering if it's true. I'm not saying it is. But if I go telling everybody, guess what? Brother or sister so-and-so did. It may or may not even be the truth. But I've given them a bad name and think, well, the preacher said it must be true. Now, not slandering people 
and, but, but on the other hand, to be peaceable. To be a peaceable kind of people. You know, Jesus would say in the Sermon on the Mount, one of the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers. There are a lot of people that want peace. But Jesus teaches us to make peace. Be peaceable. And first of all, then, that's my character. I'm not a troublemaker. I'm not a I'm not one that stirs things up with people. I'm a peaceable kind of person. That I don't do things that would cause uh, and it really begins with me as an individual. What kind of person am I? Some people are not at peace with themselves, and so they try to find some way to, to make things difficult for others. But to be peaceable. Of all the people in the world, God should see his children as a peaceable, peaceable people. The next thing he says to be gentle, to be gentle. The world is harsh. Some of you have worked secular jobs for years and worked with a lot of people. They're harsh people. They're not gentle. They're difficult to deal with. They're difficult to be around. And I believe it's Proverbs 15 and verse 1 says that a soft answer turns away wrath. So to be a peaceable and gentle people can make a difference. And I'm convinced that's part of being the light of the world. And especially people who work in retail or if you ever worked in a restaurant, I would not want to be a waiter or a waitress in a restaurant. I ran a restaurant back in the 1970s and, and people... People are, are most ill when they're hungry. You ever notice that? And they'll take it out on the server or whoever the first person is they can get to. Well, sometimes people will take things out on us. We haven't done anything. We're just there. And so we need to be peaceable and gentle. And the next thing says, showing consideration for all people or all men. Showing consideration. I'm thinking about Jesus telling us in Matthew 5 and verse 16, we're the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth. We are a light that shines to represent the Lord. We're a salt that is, has a preservative factor to make a difference in the world. If we want Christianity to survive and make an impact on the world, it starts with us, the kind of people we are. And and people will catch us off guard sometimes. I don't know everybody's personality, but when I was younger, you snap at me, I'm going to snap back twice. I mean, that's just the way I was. And precious people, I've had to work on that. Whatever weakness you have, work on that. Be a peaceable, gentle person and be respectful. You ever see some people you think, why in the world are they dressed that way? Why do they have that all over their body? And, and, and why are they holding this or that position as just as ungodly as it can be? Well, inside and underneath all of that is a human soul. Be respectful even to people that seem to have little or no self-respect. It could make a difference in their eternal destiny. But I know this, I need to be careful because if it affects my attitude in the wrong way, I won't love people. So Paul is talking about our behavior. The people, if you go back and you look, you look earlier about the people on the Isle of, Isle of Crete. Verse 12 of chapter 1 says, a prophet of their own says, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. I mean, it was a bunch of wild, ungodly people. And Paul is telling Titus to teach the church how to behave among such folk. The next thing he talks about is our past. I don't believe that Paul says in Titus 3.3 3, that this applies to every single person in every case. It's kind of a broad spectrum of things of how people have been in the past. And yet, some of these things fit us to the T. 
For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. And so not everybody was like that, but everybody has a bad past record of some kind. You've done something in your life that wasn't right. And so why is he throwing that in here? I believe he's saying, look, you've not always been a goody-goody either. You've not always been the kind of person that you are. Now, remember how you used to be before you start coming down too hard on other people. You treat them the way they need to be treated, not the way they treat others. And remember, you've not always lived like you ought to either. But something has happened, according to verse 4. Something has appeared. Something has appeared that changed Paul. Something appeared that obviously somewhere along the way changed Titus. Something appeared when the gospel was preached on the Isle of Crete that changed those people and made those uh, corrupt Cretans Christians. And yet, they need to be reminded you had an opportunity to make a change in your life, and this is what it was. The kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appear. In spite of the behavior of other people, in spite of how the government might be, you still honor the laws. And in spite of the way some people behave, you need to remember, you need to be gentle, you need to be kind, you need to, to show respect for other people. Remember how you used to be, because God did something for you that everybody needed for God to do. And that was the appearance, of the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared. Aren't you glad that Jesus came? I want you to think about it. If you think this world is in bad shape, you look at the areas where it's in bad shape. The areas where it's in bad shape is where God is not recognized or is rejected. Where God or Christianity or the Bible are made fun of or just ignored. Where people live however they want to live. And the longer they live that way, you want to know what's wrong with America? God has been forgotten. God has been ignored. But something happened to the people, and they were corrupt folks on Crete. The kindness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, appeared. There's nobody that's come to earth that's done more good for the world or ever will than Jesus did. He came here and showed us a perfect life. He never sinned. He never did anything harmful to anyone. He may have come across strong at times, but that's because people needed that. But Jesus came here as the human representation of God to show the kindness of God. If you want to be a better Christian, look at Jesus and how he lived kind of person that he was. But now why did he do this? According to his mercy. Mercy. There, I can't remember the name of the show. It's a little snippet of videos that pop up now and then of this judge and I think he's in New England somewhere. And people will come and appear before him with their cases. And He's not a judge looking to lock people up or, or make them pay fines. He's trying to analyze the situation and see what he might be able to do to help them as long as they're not just being totally rebellious. He's that kind of person. He's merciful to people who are really just... just had a bad day, just made a dumb decision one day, and that's not typically the way they are. But you see, regardless of how good we have been, or how few mistakes we have made, or how awful we've been, how many mistakes we've made, 
We all needed mercy because there's a difference in what that judge does and what the God of heaven sees. God sees sin in everybody. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3 and verse 23. In chapter 6 and verse 23, Paul says the wages or the payday for sin is death. But the free gift of God, the last part of verse says, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. How did that free gift of God get to us? By the kindness and the mercy of God. You remember what the, the tax collector said of the publican uh, going at the temple? God be merciful to me, a sinner, because he knew he needed mercy. The Pharisee couldn't see that. It's almost like he was saying, God, everybody ought to be like I am. All these things I do. Unfortunately, the Pharisees couldn't appreciate Jesus. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't appreciate the kindness and the mercy of God. They don't see it. But it appeared. But it did not and but it did not come because we were good folks. Now sometimes you'll talk about a person who's not a Christian and say, well, they're a good person. And I guess compared to some people, you would say they're good people. They work hard, they pay their bills, they've stayed married and been faithful to their spouses and you know they're respected among their peers and neighbors and they've never really been in jail for anything I mean they're just good people but they still sin nobody is so righteous that they didn't need the kindness of God nobody is so good that they didn't need God's mercy it only took one sin for God to drive Adam and Eve out of the garden of Eden just one and you go read the account and all the problems that came by one foolish, dumb decision one day that changed the many things for all mankind. Now, we're not guilty of Adam's sin, but we still pay the price for what they did. The earth's still hard to toil. Child labor's still a difficult thing. We all needed God's kindness and his mercy. We're not so good that God said, well, I'll just let you into heaven on your goodness. But something it did happen. There's, God did save us. Verse 5, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. That word by means through or by means of. What comes to your mind when you read that phrase, washing of regeneration? We know that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He paid the price. His blood was shed and the price for sin was paid. But when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, the Jewish crowd there was convinced that they were guilty of putting to death the Son of God. They didn't realize that before. They cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? We're undone here. We're in a fix. They were cut to the heart. What shall we do? Peter, by instruction of the Holy Spirit, said, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Paul says here in Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 that God saved us by or through the washing of regeneration. Paul's not bypassing the blood of Jesus. He's talking about what we did in order to procure this salvation. We quoted this and we still do, do because it's still a good example of washing. In Acts 22 and verse 16. Ananias had been sent by God, by the Lord, to talk to Saul of Tarsus. He was reluctant to go, but after three days, Ananias preached the gospel to him. In, in verse 16 of Acts 22, Ananias said, and Now why are you waiting? There was a, he'd come to the point where Saul needed to make a decision about whether or not he was going to commit himself to Christ. Why are you waiting? Arise 
and be baptized, washing away your sins. This washing obviously has to do with baptism. Jesus would tell Nicodemus, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God in John chapter 3 and verse 5. In 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, he says, For by one Spirit were you all baptized into one body. The Holy Spirit gave the message for Pentecost. The Holy Spirit gave Paul his ability to preach and to write. The Holy Spirit plays a role in the washing of regeneration. And so God has given us a means by which we may be forgiven, regardless of what we've done. I wish more people would appreciate the death of Jesus. I wish more people would appreciate the mercy and the love and the kindness and the patience of God. You know, in 1 Peter chapter 3, where in verse 20, the, Peter talks about the long-suffering of God that waited in the days of Noah. God was a patient God. And in verse 21, he says, speaking of the, the likeness of the ark being in the water, some people say, well, y'all believe in water salvation. Some of us say, no, we don't. I do. Water saved Noah and his family. They floated that ark. Water is an essential element to baptism. The water doesn't save, but you got to have it. You can't be baptized in air. You have to be baptized in water. And Peter says the light figure, whereunto even baptism, your King James says, does also now save us. Don't tell me baptism doesn't save the Holy Spirit inspired apostle says it does. So that's a response that a person has to make. But it's based on the kindness and the mercy of God who loved us through Jesus Christ. And if that foundation were not there, baptism would be nothing but a ritual to go through and produce nothing more. But because that is there, you read the last part of 1 Peter 3, 21, Baptism doth also now save us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We need to be careful when we talk to people about baptism that we understand and they understand that that's not the only thing. Jesus had to die. Jesus had to pay the price. Jesus had to be resurrected. God's mercy is involved. But my response is also necessary. How did God save us? By his mercy, by Christ, and by the washing of regeneration. Now, Paul says, who, speaking of the Holy Spirit, who being poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Now, something else that Paul says about salvation is that so, verse 7, so that being justified by his grace, see all this we have to remember the grace of God in this. Justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Did you know that you are an heir of royalty? Jesus is the king. He has a kingdom in heaven. And if you're faithful, you will be an heir to being in that kingdom for all eternity. And in hope of eternal life. We talked about hope this morning from Hebrews, and we've said it before. This hope is not a maybe. It's real. If you say, I die in hope, biblically speaking, I died expecting a real thing to happen. And that is eternal life. Paul goes on to say, Verse 18, this is a trust, verse 8 rather, this is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want you, Titus, to speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. One of the things that we fail to do sometimes as 
Christian is to be engaged or involved in good deeds. We have been working lately in the congregation here to try and be involved in some good deeds. And I believe that coming together and talking about them will make an difference. If we fail to talk about anything, we fail to do it. If we fail to commit to something, we won't do it. But if we talk about it, and I have found that it's better when you have two or three people working together than trying to do it by yourself. I know that. I've been trying to get a little boat and motor ready to go in the water. It was my granddaddy's boat. He bought it brand new 60 years ago. And when Dad died, he left some things there in Chattanooga, and he had an old boat motor there that he bought. And my brother said, why don't you just take that and take that boat that granddad's taking it home with you? Because it was all this stuff, you know. And I've been trying to get it going. What's my point? It would be a lot easier if I had somebody with me of like interest. I'd already had that boat in the water running. I mean, it won't take much. And it's the same thing with church work. People who have like interest will get things done quicker and probably more efficiently. We need to do this. But there are even times when nobody else is around and I still need to try to do good deeds because some people are not going to do them. You don't always have somebody around encouraging. But, but listen to this. Paul Titus, you speak confidently so that those who have believed in God, if you believed in God, will be careful to engage in good deeds. Sister Kathy was joking a little bit about maybe getting sleepy. I said, well, if you get sleepy and go to sleep, you're going to sleep on the Bible, not me. But I may be to blame for it, but we might want to go to sleep on this one. But how is the church going to grow if we're not involved in doing good things? Well, we won't. We won't. And these things are good and profitable. Good and profitable. Then he talks about something else. He talks about with relation to false teachers beginning with verse 9. Titus, let me tell you something, Titus. You avoid foolish controversies. Now, there are some things we have to talk about. They're important. But have you ever seen people make spring up something and it's just absolutely foolish? There's no need to even talk about that. It's just nonsense. Titus, don't get involved in that. And don't get involved in talking about genealogies. Now, that was a big deal for the Jewish people. Well, my great, 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 great daddy was Abraham or whatever, you know. And we've learned through our study in Hebrews and other writings of Paul that that doesn't amount to anything now. Our genealogy is spiritual. It's in Christ. Don't get involved in that, Titus. Don't get involved in strife. You know, there are some people who like to fuss. It seems like they just thrive on fussing about things. I don't know why, but they do. Titus, you're a gospel preacher. You're, up, you're here to help these people on Crete. Don't get involved in foolish things and genealogies and certainly don't get involved in strife. Matter of fact, if you go back to the earlier part, we need to be a peaceable people and not be troublemakers. Disputes about the law. I'm not saying, Titus, that you don't need to teach about the law, but don't get involved in disputes about it because the law no longer matters. We're not under that anymore. Why? He says, because these things are unprofitable and worthless. Have you ever heard some things that people will bring up to? Why are they talking about that? It's not important. And they'll keep on and on and on about some of these things, and they amount to nothing, and they hinder the good things we ought to be talking about. Don't you get involved in those kinds of things, Titus. A preacher or a faithful Christian in the world needs to focus on the will of God not be sidetracked with nonsense. It easily happens. And 
that if a preacher is going to be successful in his study and his work or a Christian in their life, and I'm not making a separation, we have to focus on what God wants us to be. But there are some people that won't let things go. And the next section talks about those who are factious or cause divisions. Some people will not quit doing this or that, and they cause friction, they cause division or factions in the church. And what, what I'm reading, what Paul is saying to him, to Titus about this, reject that person. It could come to the point where you have to withdraw fellowship from them. If they stir up strife in the church, you reject them. Don't you let them tear God's church up. Don't let them split God's people. He goes on to say, after a first and second warning, third time you're out. I believe we have to be patient with people, but you know there's some people, you, it doesn't matter what you do. They're going to cause trouble. What happens when you allow a person to keep causing strife and trouble in the church? The whole church gets upset. What happens when they leave? Things get better. That's what. God knows what he's talking about. It could, you go back to Romans chapter 16 and verse 7 to mark or identify those who cause divisions among you that are not according to the traditions that they were taught. In other words, if they're teaching things that are contrary to the will of God, there's a point where say you can't do that here, and if you don't stop that, you're going to have to leave. You can't allow these people to hurt the church of our Lord. What kind of person is the factious person? Perverted. That's what the Bible says. They're perverted and sinning and self-condemned. Now, precious people, I didn't say that. The Holy Spirit had Paul write that to Titus. There are some people, they're just so perverted that you can't reason with them. No matter what you say. They're going to cause trouble and they're going to say things that are anti-biblical or unbiblical. And after that first and second admonition, you reject them. We're not talking about a person who's struggling with their faith who may be questioning this or that that's not understanding some things. We're talking about people who are just downright rebellious and going to do what they want to do. You can't let them have rule. Let their behavior go on and ruin the church because indeed it will. Paul leaves with some final messages here and, and he talks about certain people and, and th some things that, that he wanted to be done, that one thinks the church must help those who are ministering to the spiritual needs of others. That's taught here. And they should be generous in providing what is needed. I'm thankful to God that over the years that, that I've never gone hungry as a preacher. There are times we questioned it, but we never went without. The church has been very good to us over the years. And our work as a, of a minister must teach. And it's interesting how he kind of winds this up. Is to teach the church so that they learn to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs. How do you decide which good deeds to get involved in? The pressing needs. The things that are high on the priority list. The things that matter the most. You know what that means? We have to be looking around, examining what needs to be addressed and, and get on that. Sometimes good works could mean sending a car. Sometimes good works could mean a phone call. Sometimes good work could be monetary assistance. Or it could be visiting or sitting with someone in the hospital. You know the things. Some things are more pressing. Do this for yourself. Go down a list. What is the most important thing that I think I could do for the Lord in the church this week? Write it down. I'm going to do that when I get home. Try to meet some of those goals because God is talking to me too. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, please do so as we stand and as we sing. Oh, do